Holler is an Appalachian folk horror fantasy setting for the Savage Worlds Adventure Edition, written by Tim Early and published in 2022 after a successful Kickstarter. The setting book comes in a 260 page book and the digital version comes with tons of support materials such as printable standees, action cards, PC archetype cards, maps, and other GM tools. As far as the substance of the holler setting, it fictionalizes the lore and legend of the people of the American mountain range called the Appalachians. The author, Tim Early, does an incredible job of presenting this culture with deep scholarship and satisfying compassion, which isn't surprising since he's a professor and published writer on the subject, as well as a native of the region. Appalachian folk are pretty much 100% of the time narrowly and negatively depicted in TV and movies, so it's a breath of fresh air to read a deep and informed take on the people, even if it's heavily fictionalized. I do need to take some time at the top of this video to explain what Savage Worlds Adventure Edition is, but I'll try not to dwell on that too long. But before that, let's take a look at the sponsor of this video. This video is sponsored by Tabletop.Land, a tabletop gaming marketplace consisting of vendors just like you. It's a mom and pop shop inspired by the idea of what should I do with all this leftover terrain and minis after my game ends? Come find everything from castles to sci-fi power plants, scattered terrain to pre-painted minis or unpainted 3D printed ones. You can even find partial terrain such as foam lumber or bricks to speed up the process of building your own. That's tabletop.land. The link is down below. Okay, Savage Worlds. It's a generic RPG rule set that has been around since 2003 in various forms. At the very beginning of time in 1997, its creator Shane Hensley published a game called Deadlands The Great Rail Wars, a miniatures war game. Five years after that, through his company Pinnacle, the rules from The Great Rail Wars were published as a generic rule set called Savage Worlds. In 2007, Pinnacle released a new version of the rule set called Savage Worlds Explorers Edition, then in 2011 a version called Savage World Deluxe, then a very similar edition in 2011 called Savage Worlds Explorers Edition. In 2015, Pinnacle put out a series of supplements that treated the age-old Rifts setting with the Savage Worlds system. I mention this because this is where a lot of people first heard about and got into Savage Worlds. Anyway, finally in 2018, Pinnacle published yet another revised version of the rule set called Savage Worlds Adventure Edition, or Suede. In the years following that, they've put out a version of Paizo's Pathfinder setting using Savage Worlds, and all throughout these two decades, there have been continuous, countless third-party settings that use the various versions of the rules. This setting, Holler, uses the latest version of the rules, the Adventure Edition. But there's a somewhat peculiar thing I need to mention here. Anytime you buy a Savage Worlds setting, or what is sometimes referred to as a Savage World, you never get a standalone RPG, or almost never. For example, with Holler, you get all the setting and archetype information, as well as little tweaks and restrictions here and there to the suede game rules, but never once a full recap or statement of the rules themselves. For that, you will need to get a copy of the Savage World Adventure Edition core rulebook, which runs about 200 pages. I read that whole rule book for this video and I have so much to say about it, but I'll just sum it up as quick as possible. If you're already familiar with the Savage World mechanics, feel free to skip to the next section. So Savage World's Adventure Edition basically works like this. When you build your character, you can take on hindrances. These are character flaws that you role play, but which afford you some mechanical bonuses. But more important are your two kinds of traits, your attributes and skills. They are both ranked by step dice ranging from D4 up to D12. Your five attributes are agility, smarts, spirit, strength, and vigor, and you start with a D4 in each. You have five points to spend on increasing the dice on any of these. If you increase your trait beyond D12, it ends up being D12 plus one, D12 plus two, and so on. As for skills, there are a set list of them in the core rulebook, but depending on the setting you're in, they can be reskinned and entirely new skills can be added to the game. You do have five core skills though, and those are athletics, common knowledge, notice, persuasion, and stealth. You start with a D4 in each of these skills at a minimum. As for the other skills, you have 12 points to spend on increasing those. The other major aspect of a Savage Worlds character is their edge. These are like one of their specialties, and you can pick these up by taking on hindrances. 
as well as racial abilities and from getting advances as your character progresses. The Suede Core rulebook reads like any general universal RPG rulebook in that it straddles a wide variety of themes and tropes. In the case of races, you'll see the most generic possible archetypes because this is really more of a recipe book for GMs and setting designers to start from. The only playable race in Holler is humans, so these other fantastical races can be ignored in the context of this video. But again, this book tries to invite GMs and creators to make their own setting and gives you pretty much all the tools you need to do it within their rules framework. The five attributes are usually used passively, such as resisting an effect, determining which edges you qualify for, and deriving your secondary statistics. The many different skills are used to actively do things. If you're curious about what kind of things are actually different in Savage Worlds Adventure Edition from the previous edition, this text box here shows a nice list of the major changes. From a GM's perspective, it's important to note that adding modifiers to a role is not an exact science in Savage Worlds. It's more like an art as described in this box here and here on the top left. The intent is to have a fast moving or at least agile gaming experience that doesn't get bogged down by the numbers. Here's a nice consolidated list of the hindrances you can choose. And here's an equally nice list of skills and edges. The edges actually go for several pages and they're what can make two otherwise identical characters in the game play very differently. You can't just pick up any edge at character creation. If you've noticed, a lot of them come with prerequisites. The letters stand for your rank of which there are five in the game. These are described as a rough measure of your character's general power, and they are gained by earning advances. Advances are doled out by the GM in milestone fashion, the frequency of which depends on the length of your campaign. In a one shot, you might get an advance in the middle of the session. For a campaign of 10 or fewer sessions, an advancement per session is recommended, and longer sessions might warrant only one advancement every two or three sessions. As for advancements themselves, there are exactly five things that they include. They're what you would expect them to be, a new edge, a skill or attribute rating increase, or removal of a hindrance. I'm just gonna add my two cents here and say that I think characters should be allowed to swap out hindrances anytime it makes sense in the story. Advances seem way too precious to spend on removing hindrances, which players have voluntarily taken on in the first place. Here's the chapter on gear, which has a smattering of all kinds of items, objects, and weapons you might find in the modern era, a fantasy world, and a futuristic sci-fi world. Again, Savage Worlds is a modular system and you can basically do two things with it. Make whatever game or setting you want out of it for personal use, or make whatever setting you want out of it and apply for publication through Pinnacle's third-party rigmarole. As far as vehicles, there's a pretty approachable system. But like combat and just the edge cases generally, the rules minutia can get a bit daunting. It says at the end of the book that you don't need to memorize all this stuff up front and just look it up as needed. So here are the rules of Savage Worlds. First, all player characters and major NPCs are called wild cards in this game. All other characters are called extras. Wild cards have a couple of things in common. One, they can all take three wounds before they're incapacitated. And two, they always roll a wild die, usually a d6, along with their trait die when making a trait check, and will take the highest of the two rolls. As far as the dice rolls themselves, when you're rolling your d6 and whichever die your attribute or skill is rated at, you're trying to meet or exceed the target number. That number is four in a lot of cases, but modifiers can bump that up or down. If any dice land on their highest value, then they ace, which is Savage World's parlance for exploding dice. You re-roll that die and keep re-rolling it as long as it keeps landing on its highest value. This ends up being one of the most prominent features of combat because exploding dice make for very swingy results. And that's a blade that cuts both ways. At least a few times per session, you're going to see a gargantuan damage roll out of nowhere. But remember that damage could either be rolled up by you or the GM. If your roll exceeds the target number by four, that's called a raise. And every four thereafter is considered another raise. Raises play into taking damage or will otherwise trigger a bonus or benefit. Critical failures occur when you roll a one on both your wild die and your trait die. It's an automatic fail, regardless of modifiers, and you suffer a narrative consequence. Bennies are handed out by the GM for any number of reasons, usually for good roleplay and gameplay. 
bennies are spent to do about seven different things. They're your classic meta currency meant to increase the fun factor in a session and avoid depressing dead ends for players. One of the main places where you're going to spend bennies is at the start of and during combat to reroll results. Suede uses playing cards to determine initiative at the start of combat. The DM deals out so-called action cards to each wild card. Okay. I can see how that might be a bit confusing. Let me say it in plain terms. The GM deals out a playing card to each player as well as for each major NPC. The minor NPCs might get lumped together and given a single card to speed up play, or they can get individual cards as well. The cards determine initiative order, but if you happen to get a joker, you can act whenever you want in a round and get a plus two to all trait rolls. The GM doesn't reshuffle the card deck until a joker has been drawn, so they're guaranteed to come up with enough draws. Characters get one regular action and their movement per turn, as well as any number of free actions within reason. Turns are six seconds each, and if you play on a gridded map, each square is six feet to a side. The most notable feature of the rules, I think, is how damage works. Anytime a successful attack is made, the attacker then rolls damage. If that damage roll is less than the target's toughness rating, the damage is more or less ignored. But if the damage roll meets or beats that toughness number, then the target is shaken, meaning that they can only take free actions. At the start of every shaken character's turn, they have to make a roll with their spirit attribute and either continue being shaken or go back to being okay and being able to take regular actions. If a target loses on an attacker's toughness roll and is already shaken, or if the attacker rolls four or more over the toughness, then the target picks up a wound each wound causes a negative one to their speed rating and all their trait rolls to a maximum of negative three. Once a PC or a main NPC, aka a wild card, has accumulated three wounds, a vigor roll is made to determine if they outright die or sustain permanent or temporary injury. This damage and injury mechanic acts as a switch with three positions. You're either good to go and doing your full range of actions, shaken and trying to avoid damage, or out of the fight. I'm going to skip over the many, many smaller rules that cover all the edge cases here, but it's worth mentioning that they are there, which is to say Savage Worlds wants GMs to move fast and light on their feet, but also has a whole encyclopedia of rules to fall back on if the GM or players are feeling rulesy. These more nitpicky rules actually go on for about 50 pages, believe it or not. One thing I think worth mentioning is that none of these rules seem weird or unintuitive. They have a very traditional, logical feeling to them if you're acquainted with mainstream RPG rule systems. And then we get to powers, which actually do come up in holler in a significant way. The rules treat powers all pretty much the same, whether they be from magic, technology, talent, or otherwise. The more important aspect that the book emphasizes is what is called trappings. You might think of this as the flavor. Depending on the setting, the same power listed in this book can be called and described as different things. As far as what a power entails, it's really just a few things. The required rank a character needs to be to use it, the cost in power points to activate it, and a description of its effects. This is a handy list of all the powers in the core rulebook, which again can be reskinned as different things depending on the setting. Okay, that took longer than I thought it would, but hopefully you get the gist of Savage Worlds Adventure Edition. It's meant to be fast and fun, but also has a lot of meat on its bones in terms of optional complexity. It's modular and takes on all kinds of wild forms depending on who's doing the writing. And its dice and injury mechanics are fairly unique. Holler, an Appalachian apocalypse, is first and foremost a really fun read. The setting is lovingly and thoroughly described as a portion of Appalachian country in the Eastern United States circa the 1920s surrounded and cut off from the outside world by a thick supernatural fog. I'll admit the map comes off as a little bit dense, but that's because the setting is presented with very little consideration of travel times. You are likely to just have scenes that take place in different places in cinematic fashion rather than play out the time and effort it takes to get to those places. The occasional exception, of course, is if getting there is the scene. To quote the introductory language of the book, Holler is a game about labor conflict, Appalachian culture, and environmental apocalypse, a mythical recreation, not a historically accurate one. It's a quote, mixture of Appalachian pulp gothic, dark fantasy, and folk horror, with a focus on strangeness, mystery, and eccentricity. 
You play as an everyday Appalachian, a blue-collar denizen of the region called the Holler, who becomes a leader in an uprising against company men called the Big Boys, who have not only shut in the region with a thick, impenetrable, quasi-magical wall of smog, but who oppress the people of the Holler and drive them to work the mines and forests with pure cruelty. The GM in this setting is called the Shift Boss, which I think is sort of an unfortunate choice since Shift bosses are more or less like a mid-level villain in the setting itself. I'll just call them the GM. As for your character types, there are 17 described here on these pages, running the gamut of rural Appalachian archetypes. But like I mentioned before, the treatment of Appalachians in the setting is done with love and care, rather than with the dripping contempt that you usually see of hillbilly culture in Hollywood. In fact, the term hillbilly is not found anywhere in this book because it's actually a derogatory term, so sorry about that. When you make your character, you first choose your hindrances, which are all accessible from the Savage Worlds Adventure Edition Core rulebook. The only hindrance you can't pick is poverty, since all PCs in this setting already have that hindrance by default. Attributes are the same as the core rules without any modification. Skills are whittled down from the original suede list to these 23 down here at the bottom. One interesting omission from this list is the research skill. The book explains that knowledge in the holler doesn't come from books, but rather from either common knowledge, folklore, the occult, or survival experience. As far as edges, no PC can have rich or filthy rich. As for gear, you get some ragged clothing and three common items. A lot of your character's flavor comes from these special hindrances. Clay eaters and varnish heads are essentially drug addicts of one sort or another. Harboring your feud or a fatalistic attitude towards life will also hurl you towards danger. But then there is the more supernatural hindrance of being hainted. I think that's Appalachian for haunted, since a haint is a mischievous or hateful little spirit that can sometimes attach to you. As far as the setting's new edges, there are about a dozen, and they each set your character up as one kind of archetype or another. The blessed arcane background gives you access to divine magic. The folk magic arcane background connects you to a more druidic source of spells. The moonshiner background gives you potions and molotovs of various effects. A gouger is a sort of pit fighter, so the gouger edge helps you in unarmed combat. The minor edge helps you see in the dark. Pickin' and Grinnin' has rerolls on performance checks, and Augers grant reroll buffs to party mates. This box on the bottom left here helps to connect some of the vanilla edges to holler archetypes. And then we have gear. As far as gear, there's really just one principle to remember. The big boys have all the good stuff and you don't. It's a 1920s Appalachian pocket dimension, so the company men have Thompson machine guns, functioning cars, and cash money, while everyone in the holler is bartering with old jalopies, record players, broke down shotguns, and illegal corn liquor. As I mentioned a minute ago, the big boys rule over the holler with an iron fist. They pay workers in a currency called scrip, which can only be spent at company stores in company towns. Those stores generously extend credit, which keeps everyone in debt, and everyone's paychecks are garnished for rent and other fees just to keep them oppressed. As a GM, all gear in the game is viewed and meted out through the prism of availability. You've got five ratings, common, uncommon, scarce, rare, and very rare. I found that the lists of gear in the book on one level were a very dry thing to read, but on another level really defined the setting in some very illuminating ways. It's artifacts like good book, banjo, dobro, corn liquor, and mouth harp that bring the picture into focus. I think one of the most chilling things of the whole book is this right here. Coffee is listed as rare. This is a horror setting. One thing to note is that ammunition is scarce in the holler, so your character is more likely to use melee, impromptu, or more primitive hunting weapons rather than guns. The big boys, of course, have better equipment such as protective suits, smoke grenades, and shock sticks. The major areas of the holler are pretty varied and most of them are dangerous. Corn Cob Gap is a dangerous passage through the mountains. Cussfoot Fens is a stinking marsh where people throw dead bodies. Fay Fall is a whole Elysian landscape filled with orchards and bright meadows and fay creatures. Essentially, the holler is a pastiche of maybe a dozen distinct zones, each of which with some distinguishing features and little towns and outposts of their own. I think the biggest takeaway here is that each of these zones is thoroughly described. And in fact, these descriptions are the heart of the setting. 
By the time you get through reading all of them, you get a very complete sense of a fantasy folk Appalachia. And not in a very general sense, in a very specific sense with specific NPCs and locations to set your adventure in. There are actually so many little details and locations in this chapter that you end up feeling like this is a real sandbox that the author has managed to create. Another important layer is the brief descriptions of Appalachian traditions. The heathen is a community's way of overcoming some hardship or tragedy by collectively drinking themselves blind over the course of a night. A hollerin is a local yelling or screaming contest that varies by town. On the creepier side of things, an offerin is any kind of human sacrifice made by a small community to an unseen beast or terror as a means of appeasement. Also creepy is the sitting up with the dead, where loved ones stay up all night with a recently deceased in order to ward away prankster spirits that want to inhabit the dead body and make it imitate the once living person in a joking manner. As mentioned earlier, players have three arcane backgrounds available to them, Blessed, Folk Magic, and Moonshiner. The book doesn't say so outright, but the Lord and the Almighty Being referred to with the blessed is clearly the Christian God. So you basically have some Jesus powered spells in here that really rival the miracles of Jesus himself. The folk magic powers are pretty powerful too. These characters are like mountain men, hermits, or so-called granny women, and they all rely on natural ingredients to concoct their magical powers. There's a whole treatment here on the right on what happens to a granny woman once she retires. She either becomes a sort of benign druidic spirit of the woods or an old witch. The moonshiner puts together concoctions that are either imbibed or thrown in order to activate their list of powers. Kind of a spoiler alert here, but here's the truth about the dark fog that surrounds the holler and keeps it isolated from the outside world. It's the result of the company men having developed a toxic vaporized metal called necrotiline in order to intentionally seal off the region. But that vapor got mixed with industrial pollutants and formed something called the blight, an ultra noxious black fog that causes violent storms and mutations in humans, animals, and plants. The blight turns animals into cryptids and kills humans. Your own character gets exposed to blight with some frequency depending on which area they're in and run the risk of debilitation and death. Actually, each time they fail a spirit check against the blight, they get an advance, which is a good thing. But on the third failed roll, the character is retired because they've turned into a monster or whatever the GM decides. This is the first Savage World setting I've ever read, so I'm not sure if Pinnacle has a template for third-party authors to use, or if the author, in this case, just did this on his own accord, but this book is filled to the brim with usable GM tools. Not just pages of location descriptions. The tables in the Adventure Generator section are just one aspect of this. There are a lot of helpful tables for coming up with various adventure details and uses your deck of cards to spit out any number of missions or complications. The NPC tables I found particularly well done. The next really impressive gift for GMs is the full length campaign included in the book. It's structured as 10 distinct acts, each arranged in chronological order. I won't page through them here as to avoid spoilers, but each act runs about six pages and has enough details to flesh out one session of gameplay each. Without giving anything away, the campaign has your characters trying to organize the residents of the holler in an uprising against the big boys, which is the openly stated theme of the game. Then there are the so-called savage tales, which are like the acts in the main campaign, but standalone one shots that can be run independently. These run three to five pages each. And again, just a gift for the GM. There are 10 of these, which felt pretty generous. Finally, in the book, there's the bestiary. You've got the big bad guy himself, Samuel Ashdown, along with a host of other major human villains mentioned throughout the adventures in the book. There's also a bunch of notable NPCs, not all of which are openly antagonistic towards the people of Holler. Then you have a variety of different regular folks statted out, maybe 20 or so different types. Most of the animals, or critters I should say, listed in this section are ones that have been affected by the blight. So it's things like giant boar and giant terrapin, I actually found these more terrifying than the cryptids themselves. But then you have the cryptids. These are basically highly mutated hybrids of animals, demons, or spirits. They're as strange as they are deadly in a lot of cases. Some of them, like the elusive green man, are clearly intended to be treated as wild cards, while a meat yardian might just be an extra. 
Anyway, the cryptids are what you would really probably find at the climax of a story in Holler in a penultimate or ultimate confrontation. But maybe not. It actually depends on what kind of game you want to run with Holler, as there are four different approaches described in the book. You could run the game as gritty post-apocalyptic survival where weapons and supplies are scarce, exposure to blight is frequent, and deadliness is high. Or you could go for the folk horror feel, which is where these cryptids take a front seat and the company men are more of a backdrop. Or you could go for a high action pulp adventure where blight isn't really the problem, but again, there are lots of weaker cryptids you could blast away along with daring do and guerrilla warfare against the big boys. Or finally, you could focus on resistance and revolution where the cryptids could end up not showing up at all and your story is about human struggle against other humans. All right, so here are my thoughts on Holler, not a standalone game. This is just an issue native to all Savage World supplements where you don't get the core rules included in the supplement. There's nothing particularly scandalous or new about this. It's how universal rule systems usually publish, but it still stings a bit for a newcomer like myself having to read the whole suede rule book before jumping into the whole holler book and then reconciling all the rules tweaks that holler makes. If you're already a Savage Worlds veteran, then it's actually a convenience that holler doesn't repeat all the game's rules written from the heart. Tim Early being not only a native son of Appalachia, but a scholar and professor of it, shows pretty clearly in much of the setting book. All I can say is that it's a pleasure to read anything that springs from the passion of the person who is writing it. And importantly, the treatment of Appalachian folk is done without ignorance or malice, something I can say I've never seen before in almost any medium, the cryptids. I skimmed over a vast majority of the cryptids at the end of this book, but they really are absolutely bonkers and would make for a pretty cinematic encounter. I say this in almost every review, but I really wish I could have seen an illustration of every one of them rather than every fourth or fifth one. But the descriptions, nonetheless, paint a really fun setting. The full host of creatures in the book is very thematic in that it captures the essence of weird Appalachia. And I trust that the author did his research with these. It took me a while to come around to reading and playing a Savage Worlds game and I'll be honest, it's mostly because the version history and the naming of each version was always pretty confusing to me. But all you need to know is that at the time of this recording, Savage Worlds Adventure Edition is the latest version and contains all the latest tweaks and changes. But who knows, if you're watching this video in a few years, you'll need to look it up again and see what the latest is. I'll say this for Savage Worlds though. It's a rule system that is extremely well polished and play tested. It's got a few major features that make it interesting at the table. The edges instead of classes give you a lot of mechanical variety of your character. The exploding dice make for a few huge moments per session. The bennies, the game's meta currency, keep things from getting too dour or deadly. And the damage mechanic with three injuries for major characters and one injury for minor characters and no hit points to have to keep track of keep things simple and fast in combat. But to be honest, these sort of features can be found in a lot of games. I think the enduring success of Savage Worlds at this point is not just that it's polished and has these mechanisms for fun, but that there has been so much buy-in from third-party creators over the years. I complained a minute ago about having to read the Savage Worlds rules books before reading Holler, but once you've actually read the core rules, check out how many different supplements you have access to. It's just hundreds upon hundreds of adventures and settings. Admittedly, not all of them are keyed to the latest version of the rules, but the rules haven't actually changed all that dramatically over the years, so you still have access to a pretty cohesive game ecosystem. I think it was a good rules choice for Holler as well, since it lends itself to faster cinematic pulp action play with dramatic encounters. And that's what the soul of Holler seems to be screaming for after all. Anyway, that's all for now. Links are below. Thanks for watching. See ya.